Uh, Chris Moneymaker, it's great to have you with us. I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk with us. Yeah, it's great being here. You know, this is the uh, second event I've played with you guys and I uh, look forward to doing it again. Uh, try to fit in some charity as much as possible, especially when, you know, kind of sitting at home and got some free time. And I love these little virtual tournaments that we do. It makes it really easy. We can fit them into the schedule. Well, uh, yeah, we appreciate it. As, and as you just said, we're, we've got a uh, online poker tournament coming up for uh, the benefits of the Chicago Lighthouse. And uh, you played back with us back in February, and we appreciate you, you coming out and playing with us again. What, what is it about charity tournaments that, that attracts you? Well, I mean, anytime you can give back and help people, I mean, you know, it, it's especially like in today's world where it's tough to, to get together and meet and do fundraising. Um, it's really hard to have ideas to, to raise money for organizations that really need the help. And poker is a pretty good way to um, raise that money without having to interact with people and without having to, you know, socially interact, which, um, you know, we're hopefully getting back to a little bit more normalcy, but um, it's, it's good to have this version and be able to, to do this and do it from the home, um, and help basically raise money for organizations that desperately need it. Um, so, and again, it's something I just enjoy doing on the side and, um, you know, it gives me a, you know, I, I take up people's money for a living. So, uh, to give back is always a nice thing. <laughs> you know, poker is a zero sum game. So. If I win, someone's got to lose. <laughs> is there a different atmosphere playing in a charity tournament than a sort of any other hardcore kind of tournament? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, in a charity tournament, it's all about rebuys. It's all about getting the money in for the charity. You know, we'll do a lot of, you know, put, putting the money in right away and trying to get as much action as possible. Usually I'm, push, I'm pushing action as much as possible to either rebuy myself or get other people to rebuy. Um, it's definitely not a kill or be killed attitude that you would have in a normal poker tournament um after the rebuys are done it kind of transforms into that a little bit comes mm -hmm. a little bit more competitive and you're trying to win but at the end of the day uh the whole the primary goal is for everybody to have a good time and also everybody to you know raise money for the charity i'm assuming over the last year and a half uh or so you've been playing primarily online is that right that's a pretty good assumption yes i've, I've been doing that uh <laughs> just about every single day What's it, what, what's it like playing online for you as opposed to uh, live? It's just a completely different game. I mean, when you play online, you're using a lot of uh, statistics. You're using a lot of – you're using a computer program that's monitoring how often people are playing hands, and you use that information to make decisions. Uh, where when you're playing live, it's more about people interactions and how they react and – breathing patterns and blinking patterns and all, all these other little small things, looking at people's hands. Um, so you give away um, the physical traits and the physical looking at people and engaging for frequencies and tendencies. Um, so it's a lot different to actually play online versus on uh, live. And some people have a tough time can, you know, transitioning from one to the other, whether they're, not as comfortable playing live or they don't understand uh, that online is a much different game online. People don't value their tournament life as much. So they're much more willing to go broke because they can just go play another tournament very easily. It's easy to play seven, eight tournaments at a time where if you go in and play live, you've invested the time to go to the casino to play the tournament and you don't want to bust. You want to experience that as long as possible. So you value your tournament life and when you value your tournament life, you're easier to bluff. You're easier to get off your hand. So you're easier to play in general. And you can really tell when you're playing with somebody who you can run off hands and who, who is uh, willing to gamble. And it's a little bit more polarized, if you will. More people are making these um, extreme decisions based on the different criteria of playing online or playing live. Right. And, and, and just to be clear... Uh, you're not using HUD displays or you can't, I mean, there's, I, I, and the, in the charity tournament, we're not, you're not going to be able to have statistical uh, uh, data on the, the yeah, I'm not, well, first of all, I wouldn't even use it on a charity event, but um, you know, and it's not an option to do it even without doing that. Uh, I've been playing enough online that it kind of comes naturally of just knowing I can pretty much guess what your uh, VPIP, which for yeah. people that don't know, that's your voluntary uh, money put into pot. Like that, that tells you how active you are um, and then how often you're raising. I mean, I can pretty much tell you uh, within a 
you know, pretty good number of where you are just based on playing, you know, thousands and thousands of hands online. So sure. um, I don't even need the HUD um, because I've been playing so long that I can pretty have a pretty good idea of, um, you know, how often you're playing. And if you're, you know, getting out of line, you're playing hands, you shouldn't play. Um, so, and especially, I don't play that many tables at a time. I'm usually playing one or two tables at a time so I can focus on the tables where most people that are using HUDs are playing 10, 12 tables at a time. And they're relying on that HUD to give them the information where I can, I simply observe it and I know what to look for. I know, you know, the things I'm looking for are how, like I said, how often are you putting money in the pot? How often are you raising? How often are you folding to three bets? How often are you three betting? Um, and then, you know, when it gets to showdown, what is your hand range that you show, say, an early position? And if you're showing something like, I don't know, ace five um, suited off suit, whatever it is, I know that you're going to be playing too many hands out of position. So that right there is going to tell me a lot of information about you and how you play. As you know, from February, or you, you probably remember, um, we also in this uh, Lighthouse tournament have a Zoom connection so that it's not completely online, it is an online tournament, but there you're also able to see and interact with, talk, chat with of uh, your table mates. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, does, is, is that social aspect and ability now to see people and stuff, is that, is that a different experience then for you than I mean, online? I mean, it's obviously a little bit different experience. I mean, you know, the 90% of the time or 99.9% .9 of the time you're playing online, there, there's zero social interaction. Um, you know, you might say good hand to somebody or, you know, whatever, but like when you have the zoom call, which only happens in charity events, I mean, you're, you're never gonna have a zoom call during a, uh, online tournament. So the, this adds just an element of socialism, uh, socialism, that's not probably not the right word for it, uh, of social <laughs> aspect, to, yeah, personalization, <laughs> social aspect to the game. Um, and it, you know, it, it's good for the charity because, um, that, we're here to, you know, support the charity and support each other and have a good time with it. And it's hard to have a good time when you're sitting in a room by yourself and just staring at your computer. So the, the zoom call aspect of it does add a lot to be friendly, get to know people know who you're playing against. It's always nice to know who's on the other side of the screen. And, um, you know, if you run a big bluff and you can watch them like, Oh, and so it's always good. <laughs> I imagine you're, I mean, it, it, fairly clear you're a pretty competitive guy, but you come off and the table is pretty relaxed and easygoing. And, and, and I'm curious, how easy is it to be both competitive and at least on the outside, easygoing when you're playing? Well, I mean, that's obviously it, for a poker player, it's probably the most important, one of the most important skills you can have. Um, in poker, there's a lot of private games. There's a lot of, um, games that are hard to get into and if you don't have social skills if you're not sort of easy going and, and good to be around fun to be around you're not going to get invited to these games if you're just a crusher and don't have a social side to you then um no one wants to play with you and you know you just got to take your ball and go play somewhere else um so to be able to to get into those games you got to have a good social side and to be honest i've always approached poker like i told you a little bit earlier um in order for me to win someone's got to lose well, I look at every player that I'm playing against as a potential customer, because if they're not there playing, then there's no game. So I want them to have a good experience. And whenever I play, I always feel like I've done my job when someone says it was great playing with you and shakes my hand after I take all their money. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that happens actually quite more than you would imagine. Um, but that's always when I know I've done my job because they had a good experience. They weren't upset. They lost their money. They they, they battled and, uh, you know, they end up on the, the losing side. Um, and then if I lose, obviously I lose a, a ton. I mean, in poker, you're going to lose a ton. Um, I know that when they beat me, they, you know, people have a story and, you know, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard, you know, I beat you in this hand or I, I knocked you out of this <laughs> tournament. And, you know, I'm like, no, you didn't. That's lies. All lies. I never <laughs> lost. Um, so, but, you know, they, they, they hit me up, you know, 10 years down the road on social media saying, Hey, I knocked you out of this tournament and, um, you know, tunica or wherever. And, uh, it was a good experience for him. It's been 18 years since you won the main event. If you can Thanks for that. that. 
<laughs> what what's kept you in poker so long? Well, I love the game. I mean, you know, back when I first started playing, I, I mean, funny story is uh, me and my buddy went down to Tunica. It's about a four hour drive from where we were before I won the main event. And I was a you know young college kid at the time. And uh, we got we pulled into the casino and I was so excited to get in the door to start playing poker. I left the car running. And I got halfway to the casino to my buddy's like, dude, you left your car running. I'm like, so I, I enjoy playing the game, first of all. And that, that, that goes a long way to, to the longevity of the game. I mean, you know, say do what you love. So it's easy for me to play poker. I, I, I do enjoy the game. Now, obviously, it's changed over the years for me. Um, one, I've gotten a little bit more seasoned, a little bit more experienced. So um, where, you know, before, if I got an invitation to go play, like there's a, there's a game down the street this weekend. It's a $50 buy-in with a bunch of neighbors, a bunch of friends. Like I would, in the past, I would always go to that game because I love playing poker and it's something fun. I do enjoy the social aspect of it. Um, but now that I play all the time, I, I generally don't do those smaller games like that with, with friends because um, they're, they're doing it for enjoyment, which is great. It'd be kind of like work for me. I mean, no matter what you do at the end of the day, eventually it turns into work and, while I do enjoy what I do, I don't want to do excess of it just to do it. I mean, I'm still, you know, I got to wake up tomorrow and, and play. So while I do love it, I do balance. I try to balance, you know, my time so I don't get burnt out. And that's a big problem with a lot of players is they, they love it so much. They get burnt out and they don't want to play it anymore. Well, I try to maintain a balance with family and um, other things other than, you know, playing poker. And, you know, I do that by, you know, doing interviews like this, doing charity events. Um, I've got a couple other projects that I work on. And then I have a wife and three kids at home and uh, they definitely keep me moving and, you know, uh, off the poker tables. You recently had a, um, a, a dispute with PayPal um, uh, where they froze your account and so on. Can, can you describe what happened? Yeah, so essentially, uh, you know, I play fantasy football like millions of other people, and I'm the commissioner of the league. So um, I ran a $1,000 league, and everybody sent me the money to hold for the season because, you know, you can't play fantasy football and let everybody hold their money and, you know, come try to collect at the end when they lose. <laughs> so you get all the money up front. So that way you can pay people out at the, at the end. Well, I collected um, all of the – uh proceeds or all the the tournament uh buy-ins on paypal and so i had twelve thousand dollars in my paypal account that was sitting there uh waiting for the end of football season so i could pay out the winners of the fantasy football league well they ended up locking my account saying that i was doing a legal activity breaking their terms of service and i could get the money back in 180 days so <laughs> First of all, I had to come out of my own money to pay people that won the fantasy football league. Um, but I knew I would get the money back in 180 days or whatever. And, you know, whatever, I just put it back in the account. Um, well, it came to about 160 days when I'm locked down on my account and my money disappeared. They came and they said that for every instance of um, someone sending me money that was, they deemed against, uh, their terms of service they took a $2,500 penalty um that was uh be you know when you sign up for paypal you you sign something saying that if they find that you've broken in their view terms of service whatever that is um they're going to take $2,500 so they cleaned my account out essentially um obviously this upset me and i went on social media and you know complained and um when i did that we come to find out that there's hundreds, if not thousands of people that have done, that have gone through this. And a lot of them are not doing it with fantasy football. I mean, we've had charities, we've had legit businesses. We've had so many, I mean, the lawsuits that we started, we, we started a clash action suit against PayPal. And um, there is millions of dollars that they are just essentially confiscating from people's account for no reason. Now, you know, you might look at my, my thing and say, well, you know, fantasy football, you should have lost the money. It, it, so it wasn't your money, but they've taken money out of, you know, again, pet charities and legit businesses, and it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they generally do this when um, you have a lot of money in your account. So 
PayPal for me, what they did is they did this, but, and I threatened them and, um, you know, didn't hear anything from it. But once we started the, the process, uh, the process of the lawsuit, getting the class action together and, um, they start, we started getting momentum. All of a sudden I go back and I have the money back in my account. It reappeared in my account and I was able to withdraw it and I got my 12,000 out of there. And I assumed that, I guess that they thought I would just go away at that point. And, um, you know, they, they pay me my money. So I, I would just go on and, and, and leave them alone. Well, I'd already told them if they don't pay me like, you know, this week, I'm going to come after them no matter what. So I'm, I stayed with a lawsuit. Um, I, I'm not getting anything out of the lawsuit anymore, but I'm just an advisor trying to get people together and, you know, basically being a voice to try to get other people's money back. Because even though I got paid back, there's hundreds of thousands of other people out there that are not being able to be paid back because they don't have a voice. And that's just not right. What they're doing, it, it, it can't be legal to what they're doing is where they literally are just stealing people's money and people don't realize it. And it could be, you could be as innocent as, you know, taking, getting money for, for rent from your renters and they'll just come and, and they can swipe your money if they, they think it's breaking their terms of service for any reason. I mean, again, you can collect money for this charity and they can just come and take all the money. And especially when you have a company like PayPal, for example, that takes money from DraftKings and takes money from other gambling organizations like i can go and and fund my DraftKings account which is a daily fantasy sports account or it's a gambling account through paypal but since pay, you know my fantasy league paypal's not making their their rip their money off of that deal they they feel like they can come in and just take my money um you know if you're if you're gonna be a company either take the vig off every transaction so you make your money but don't don't penalize you know, somebody for using your product, uh, whether it be for gambling or for charity, uh, just because you feel like it. In the last few years, uh, the, uh, many players have adapted their plays to GTO and solver strategies. How much have you done that? Uh, quite a bit. I've, I've been working with a group uh, working on GTO. We use solvers. And, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't understand is, um, you don't really want to pattern your game after GTO. People hear this term of game theory optimal, playing perfect poker. Um, but what people don't understand is um, if you play game theory optimal poker or perfect poker, you're actually giving your all you're doing is making it to where your opponents can't exploit you but you're also not exploiting any of your opponents. So you're playing a zero sum game. A yeah. lot of times you're playing a game where, you know, you're not going to get taken advantage of, but you're not going to take advantage of anybody else. So what you really need to do as a poker player is realize what GTO is, learn what it is, and then how to adapt away from that to exploit and to make money. Um, because if you just play the computer way, the GTO way all the time, you're not going to make any money. You're going to forgive people's mistakes as much as you're going to safeguard you from people taking advantage of you. So you use the game theory optimal, the, the best play when you're playing against a superior opponent. But when you're playing against a weaker opponent, that's when you deviate and you play a more exploitive style where they could take advantage of you if they knew how. But since they don't know how, you know that you can deviate and that's how you make your money in poker. Back in... When I first started playing, it was, ooh, I have aces, good, let's go, or I have ace king. Um, you know, you just have a hand and you go with it. But there's a lot of evolutions into being a poker player. Some is, you know, knowing what I have, knowing what your opponent has, making you think you know what I have, et cetera, et cetera. It goes, there's so many different levels to it. Well, when you talk, start talking about GTO and you start talking about all these sims and stuff, it's over the course of the years, it's definitely changed the game. But the thing is, the decision tree that you have at every different point, the more hands that you play pre-flop, the bigger your decision tree gets, the more complex it gets. So you can never really play, it's really hard to play perfect game theory optimal poker, um, even though you still, you're not really wanting to do that. It's really hard to even do it if you wanted to, because there's so, the decision tree is so big. Every time you make a decision, 
it comes with consequences that comes with another whole tree of decisions that follows. So as you can see, when you fake your, make your first decision, that's going to make so many different um, variables go into play for your next decision. You know, the flop, your opponents, all these different things are these variables. And usually, you know, for GTO, it's not really your opponents, your, your opponent stack size specifically. Uh, GTO doesn't take into consideration opponents. It's assuming that your opponent is the perfect player. So, and that's what makes GTO so good is because you're always, if you're playing against superior opponents, it's going to give you the best answer against a superior opponent. Um, but it does take into consideration their stack size, the pot size and things like that. But everything, uh, every decision you make will affect future decisions. So you can never always play perfect with GTO, but it does affect the game and, and how we approach it today. And it also affects, honestly, for me and for a lot of players, it takes away the emotional side of the game where you get so um, beat up about taking bad beats. I mean, you know, obviously in this game, you're going to lose. You're going to take bad beats. You're going to get sucked out on the river. That's just part of the game. Once you learn a little bit more about GTO, you learn about variance and you learn how often this actually happens. So when it happens to you, it's like, yeah, it happens. No big deal. It's going to happen for me as much as it happens against me. And that's a big, you know, honestly, as a poker player, that's a really big thing to, to get over, to know that um, this is just variance and it happens. And it, it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to actually study it and live it and see it and not be bothered by it. Thank you again for your time. Very, very helpful and uh, appreciate uh, uh, thoughts and, and uh, uh, perspectives you have here. It's, uh, uh, I look forward to playing with you uh, in, in a few weeks. Sounds like a plan. Look forward to taking all your cash and making your rebuy for charity. You know. <laughs> Fantastic. Love it.